taking care of Germany, of Russia, and then we got involved in Women Tech Makers. She's doing a talk about uh, actions on Google. We're going to have a workshop tomorrow. She's going to help out as well about that. And I was the newest GD expert, so Google Developer Expert, exactly on this matter. Welcome to our Dev Fest. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we met like so many years. We've been so so many Google IOs and everything. Yeah. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for coming. This is the last session before lunch, so I will try to keep it on time. To not so you are not late for your sandwiches or whatever you have pizza. <laughs> uh, no idea. So a little bit about myself. Oh yeah, a talk is about Google Assistant and mainly so I wanted to focus here about differences between graphical world where you, you, you know, we're used to that to Android, if you're Android developer, if you're front-end developer, back-end, etc. And, and the voice kind of new world. So it uh, won't be, you know, uh, about specific, for example, it, it's not about testing, but it's more about you understanding and uh, getting the best practices because uh, that's something that I collected while working with clients, with communities and some mistakes you know, that people usually do, developers usually do. So I don't want you to repeat them. So that's why we're here to kind of go through that, uh, through this process. Yeah, so a little bit about myself. I'm Google Developer Expert, how Tima said, for Assistant. Google Assistant, I'm leading Google Developer Group and WTM communities now in London since three years. Before that, like she said, I was living for more than 10 years in Germany, in Stuttgart. Uh, also, GDG for, was uh, GDG for Stuttgart. I am mentoring uh, startups in uh, Google Launchpad. This is like a seed stage uh, incubator by Google, where I help people to explore and to leverage AI in their products and, and uh, yeah, just to help them uh, achieve their goals. I'm director of at Motor Award. I used to work for Google uh, in Munich and then in Hamburg. I uh, did my PhD in quantum chemistry and I'm UK STEM ambassador for where I'm teaching kids how to code, uh, how to learn Python, how to learn Microbit, uh, Scratch, etc. depending on the kid's uh, age. That's it. So voice revolution or some people say evolution. I prefer evolution because I think this is a long process. So a little bit introduction before we jump in onto the meta. So every 10 years or so, the technology is uh, experiencing kind of like a jump. So there is a major shift happening in paradigm. So we've been through desktop, we've been through mobile, we saw it all. And now people are arguing. So there are kind of two competing, in a way, uh, areas. Some, some people say that the future is for kind of going into VR and AR direction. I, of course, as a Google Assistant, uh, Google uh, GG for Assistant, think that and uh, hope that it's going into the you know AI and voice uh, direction. So, of course, uh, they can cooperate, they can coexist these two directions. But the the truth is that AI is playing big role nowadays in technologies. And actually, Sundar Pichai said that the next ten years they will be AI first, and uh, they will be everywhere. You will experience it at home, on the go, in the car, and this is something that we actually. So in the last Google I.O. So if you've been there, you saw that Google Assistant is literally everywhere, from your watch to through the you know phone and everything, and up to your car and headphones. Next, I like the Gartner. They actually said that it, voice is more than just the next technology. It's actually the whole paradigm shift. It's uh, the mindset. Why it's a mindset? Because you, the way you are developing for voice, you have to actually rethink what you are doing. You have to rethink how you're developing. And the last thing, this is my favorite marketer, marketing person uh, from actually I think New York. He's based in New York. He said that if you, right now, it doesn't matter if you're developing something like some product, some brand, or if you want to create an agency, development agency, and start working with clients, you know, with other companies and developing uh, actions for them, your company might grow up to size of Facebook, Instagram, Pandora, because the, the opportunities are huge. And working again with clients in London, I see that because remember the time 10 years ago when companies were asking out themselves, do I actually need to have you know Android app, iOS app? That time was actually there. And nowadays people come uh, to me, to my colleagues in this area, and they're asking, do I need to have Google Assistant app? Do I need to have Amazon Alexa skill? And it's just surprising for me people 
still, you know, arguing and kind of not sure because we saw it 10 years ago and now nobody is, you know, worrying or being, you know, kind of weird about having Android app because it's so clear. So I hope in 10 years we will come back to that conversation, maybe with the same kind of crew here with the same group of people and I will remind you about that and we will be, you know, just laughing about that. So this is the kind of... Um, the landscape of uh, AI Assistant nowadays. So I want you to focus, this is lots of data, but just let's focus on Google Assistant for now. So some people tell me, okay, Google Assistant is actually quite late to the market. Uh, we had already Siri out there, Cortana, Alexa, they were all there when the uh, Google Assistant uh, came to the market. But if you think about that, the underlying technology ML, AI, um, and uh, NLP, all those kind of technologies, they were part of Google's strategy for many, many years before that. And we had Google now, we had lots of other technologies. That's why it's true uh, to say that Google came really prepared and they delivered a really high quality, um, uh, high quality service or product platform now, developer platform. That's why don't be scared and afraid that that is kind of late to the market. It's really top notch platform, especially for developers. That's why we're here. So why Google Assistant? Of course, I want you to focus on Google Assistant, even though I actually used to develop also for Amazon Alexa, but once Google released this platform for developers, which happened two years ago, uh, I just jumped right away because it offers so many opportunities for us as developers. So a little bit about in and out. So again, I want you to focus. So people sometimes forget that you can actually input data through typing. So if you have to input things like, sometimes people experience um, uh, complexities with like, let's say DAH. Uh, you say it in a one way, but then you write it in English, it, it, you, you might read it like a like Dutch, we all know. Uh, those kind of things you can always solve with the written input. Then there are sources. So this is something that Google just won my heart over Alexa because Google has tremendous number of resources uh, being, you know, of course, Google search, all this knowledge graph, news, weather, flights, hotels, everything that you can actually leverage in your applications. Now, on the right side, I want you to focus only on one thing. Of course, it's kind of all obvious. You can have actions, you can have answer, but you can also have output as a question. So if you're, for example, trying to book flight, Google Assistant might come back to you and ask the question. Let's say, I didn't understand, or, you know, what was the date of the flight? This is kind of the, the, the intro. Now, um, it's important to remember that your action will immediately be available across all devices. So that was actually not clear du during Google I.O. And I actually asked Google Assistant team, it was the secret back then. But now it's clear that once you develop action, even if you didn't optimize it for devices like that, and I will show you that later if you didn't see Home Hub yet, um, it will be immediately av available everywhere. So will your user be able to use it on hub, uh, Home Hub, let's say, in London? Absolutely, yes. Will it look ugly if you will not optimize it for HAP? Uh, yes, it will look ugly. But tomorrow, if you will come to workshop from Timea, you will actually learn how to optimize it so that it's also visually appealing, not just, you know, top-notch, uh, high-quality performance. Next. So these are all devices. You see Home Hub again here. Let me just quickly open it so that um, you can actually, after this talk, oops, um, so this is uh, something that was been, uh, I think has been announced at October 8th. This is Home Hub. Unfortunately, it's available right now only in three countries um, in the world, in Australia, in the UK, and the, in the United States, except Puerto Rico. So this is uh, how it looks like, and this is the kind of the visual component. We won't talk today about optimization, but if you come tomorrow, then definitely we'll talk about all kind of, you know, responses, rich responses, and everything that, um, that will help you to optimize for Google Home Hub. Yeah, well, um, next, so languages. There are lots of lots of languages. What I want to show you here and kind of tell you a little bit. Uh, so it all looks cool, you know, but what are the real life examples? From my personal experience, I optimized one of my uh, Google Assistant apps to two languages, which I speak, uh, German and Russian. And immediately, within a week, I got 4.2 times more users and engagement in a week. 
just two languages. Imagine what would happen if I would, to, if I would speak or I would have translators in 10 different languages. So definitely think about that. That's not just empty words. It actually does work. And uh, something that also played a role in my case, that I launched it in Russian market, and that was the reason why I did that. Um, the day the, it was launched in Russian market, so there were not so many actually competitors there yet. But so I think about that, what is the next market uh, you know, Google Assistant is coming to? Maybe you can actually leverage that. It's called news jacking in the kind of marketing world. But yeah, definitely think about strategy and localize it. Uh, so this is kind of the, how Google Assistant is trying to conquer the, the, the whole world. Now, voice is the human nature. So this is very important to understand that conversation is something that our society is built uh, on. So uh, if you look at this graph, you see that spoken language, the way we speak to each other, is much, much, much older than the way we speak to computers. That's why what Google Assistant team and conversation design team at Google always tell us, uh, us in blog articles, also in uh, this GD conference uh, last week, two weeks ago, they told us, don't try to change the way people interact with, you know, computers. Try to optimize your action so that person can actually naturally talk. And that is, should be your goal uh, when you are building action. You should make it so natural so that no matter what I ask, there are no ways, uh, I never hear back, you know, from your, from your action, oh, I actually didn't understand. Can you repeat that? Because nothing can be more annoying than that. So. I wanted to, so there, there is a big science uh, which is called conversation design, but we don't have that much time. It's actually time for like four hour workshop. Since we have only like around 40, maybe actually less minutes, I want to just take two rules out, the, of, out of the whole science and focus on them. So first rule is called too less, too much. This is a very interesting rule. So if you look at these two examples, uh, Leslie said, do you know who is coming to the party? So for computer, in this case for Google Assistant, that is a purely yes, no questions, a question. Because let's say ask, do you know? So computer would say either yes, I know, or no, I don't. But, and that's what Mark says as a, as a computer, let's say, right? But is it something that is enough for the human conversation? Is it something that Max actually, or let's say actually wants to know? No, she actually wants to know, Yes, if yes, then who is coming? And if no, why don't you know who is coming? Or the second example, Max asked, can you play a song for me? And Leslie said no. No, but it sounds quite true, right? No, why? Is maybe Spotify is not available, uh, let's say, in, um, somewhere. Or maybe there is no Wi-Fi connection. So you want to be cooperative. You want to be cooperative, but not too much cooperative, okay? So this is the example where it becoming too much. So for example, uh, imagine you are building SMS app and then you are telling the user, here is the, you know, you got three messages. In order to delete message, uh, say delete message. In order to read message, say read message. In order to you know, reply to message, say reply to message. Remember what I told you, it should be so natural. It should be, of course I should say delete message to delete message because that's how it's supposed to work. So this is something that is called too less, too much. And we, as human beings, we actually don't notice it, but we use this cooperative principle in our lives all the time. So next time you talk to each other, try to notice you actually, all of you, help each other, trying to give a context. You know, sometimes, uh, uh, like recently I told per, uh, my friend that I'm actually in Dublin, and he's like, which Dublin, California Dublin or Ireland Dublin? That time I was in California, so it was like, oh, okay, so you are in the California Dublin. So this way you actually help each other, okay? Second principle, and the last one for today, but the science is again big is the, the maximum of quantity. And this is something that is um, being described as conversation is much more than just literal exchange of information. Three quick examples. So I really need a drink. Have you been to the Eagle? What can we get from this short conversation? Probably the Eagle is a bar, right? Because like it's probably not a supermarket. Second, what we can get also probably it's nearby. Probably I don't need to take a plane to go there, right? And number three, probably it's something that uh, semi been before. So it's kind of like uh, uh, kind of reassuring to actually know where is the eagle. And the second conversation is what, what did the letter from IRC is the finance hunt? Uh, let's say the finance hunt say. 
are you sitting? So as a computer, there is no way you would understand the answer, are you sitting down? But as a human being, when you get a letter from Finansam, all of us know, okay, something, you know, something went really terribly wrong. So this is something very complicated about conversations. And the third example, which actually I also got wrong. So when I was reading book about the conversation design, I thought Google Assistant should actually understand how many people are going, let's say, to the party. And the answer is, it's my wife and myself. It's obvious, there are two of us, right? It's, you know, but it turns out for computer, it's really hard to count, in this case, till two. So definitely think about that when you're building next action, that it's, it's much harder than you know, just uh, being able to parse the conversation and to you know, maybe send it to your uh, server and then get an answer. It's much harder than that. I don't want you to scare, but um, this is the, Oh no. Uh, so, and now uh, two existing examples from Google Assistant very quickly, which are already existing and you can use them. Uh, my favorite is timer. As a German, I, I, I love, you know, being always on time. So I, I, uh, I love my timer and I set it like for 20 times for everything during my day. But basically, if you say thank you to, to the timer, then it will just turn off. So hopefully you don't say shut up or, you know, something like that and think rude to your Google Assistant, even if it's not human being. So just say thank you. And this is again context, right? You said thank you and Google Assistant understood uh, what you meant. And the second example, really also cool. So if person is asking, show me pictures of the state flower of California. The, it's not just showing picture, but Google Assistant actually understands that the person doesn't know the name of the flower. Since person chose this way to describe, you know, show me the flower, which are blah, 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 on the state of the California. And that's why they say here, by the way, it's called the California poppy. Kind of a little extra information. And this is again something that is, uh, I want you to keep in mind when you're building Google Assistant. Now, uh, we will quickly go through the five differences between graphical uh, interface and the uh, voice interface. So first of all, create persona. It's really, really important for you that your action has persona. Now, I don't know, uh, anybody work here with like real marketing personas when you develop uh, actions? Yes, you did. Okay, awesome. So you know, so uh, you have to forget everything you knew about that. This is not that, okay? So usually, I will just explain to you. So usually when you create, let's say, Android application, you uh, create like five personas. We actually did that with UTMA in Mountain U in, I think, 2012 or something, or 11, uh, but there was like a workshop. Anyway, uh, so you create five marketing personas, let's say, young woman, uh, you know, like 25 years old, um, no babies. Then like a uh, next persona, potential user of my Android application is the man in his 30s, for example, right? So you kind of define your audience. This is not it, okay? So in this case, persona is actually your action. Is that voice behind in Google, in Google Assistant, okay? And that's very important. So now, everybody here got persona. There are kind of two types of personas I want you to think about. Sometimes persona is just one person. Uh, in this case, let's say business person always suit up, you know, uh, kind of like a Zako trigger, like we say, right? And then there is a hip hop person, uh, you know, writing graffiti, break dancing, etc. kind of a different type of persona. Uh, and then there is a clown, always, you know, maybe funny, etc. But there are also personas, if you think, we, each of us, playing different roles in our life. For example, uh, I'm an international speaker, but I'm also a friend and a wife, and I'm also a mom. Um, that's why one person can have several personas in them, and that's something that you have to think about. Now, personas are... Oops, it died. Uh, oh, no, give me a second. Okay, just so basically, oops, maybe something about Wi Fi. Um, yeah, I really have to go to the slide. So basically, okay, I'll just quickly tell you. So, personas is something that, um, let me reload it. Can you, can you maybe tether me Wi Fi? Yes. Oh, 
wait, doesn't wait. That's not. They have to go to the left. I, I'm sure I can look in this here. Anyway, I will continue. So, so the next slide is <laughs> uh, basically persona is something that uh, every application should, should have. So if you don't define your persona, then your application will have kind of parts of persona. So oftentimes developers, they are kind, kind of a little bit lazy. So they tell me, you know what, first I will develop an app, I will publish it, and then, you know, when I have time, I will work on my persona and, you know, polish my application. The truth is, the moment your user will start application, they will kind of assign persona to your application, they will feel, you know, is this persona, let's say, uh, they will guess the age, they will guess all these kind of characteristics. So definitely don't leave it up to chance. Develop your persona first and then develop application. Do this like a step by step. It reminds me, probably you know old Reto Meyer, who was like developer advocate for Android a uh, long time ago. He was used to joke, you know, that developers, they usually don't pay attention to design. They always think that if application is, you know, working really well, people will come. So the truth is, in, in case of voice application, design is actually voice design. So if your action will uh, lack the persona, uh, people will use it, but people won't stick. And you will see it in analytics, the retention rate, the, the way that you will actually be able to retain user will actually, it doesn't work. Can somebody tether uh, quickly? I mean, it's not, it, it's like a few megabytes, if it's okay. I, oh, it works. No, no wait. Okay. Yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, but it shouldn't be. And uh, basically, uh, this is the wrong one. The wrong one? Yes. Um, so the way you. Um, anyway, we will continue. Uh, so yeah, if you could. Yeah, thank you so much. It just. <laughs> it just okay, awesome. Sorry about that. Uh, it is my London sim. I I can use it in uh, in Vienna, but I cannot tether. Uh, they kind of they my carrier for bit uh, tethering. Um, anyway, so again, so what happens uh, about persona? Uh, the easiest way to think about that when you get a call from person you don't know on the phone. The moment, let's say a minute or two after you start talking to a person, you understand a few things. And that is, let's say, you can guess the age of the person. You can definitely almost always tell the gender of the person. You can also know the social context. And that is something, is it the boss who is calling? Or is it somebody calling who is below you in the social context? Maybe somebody, you know, on your team and you are team lead. Or maybe it's your body calling. Next, you can understand the accent, locale. You, so you should, or you, you should be able to understand that person is not from the country, let's say, you are from. Unless you speak the same, uh, unless you have the same accent, then you don't hear the, the accent. And the last thing you understand is also how well educated the person based on the slang they're using, based on their you know, richness of their vocabulary. So this is the kind of one thing. This is the traits of the person which are unchangeable pretty much. If person has education, you know, he, he has education. And then there is a second type of, uh, and I will show you slides in a moment, so kind of, but I wanted to explain that there are also inferred traits. Inferred traits means that um, the features of the person, which are, you can kind of, uh, which are changeable. Oh, awesome. Can you? Yes. I think so the it's just link has a problem. No, no, no problem. It just should be right here. Yeah, it's there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, no, no, no. It's all right. Not worry. You'll still be on time for, <laughs> for lunch. Uh, so that there you go. So that's what we're talking about. So um, let me just, I will quickly go back. So that's what I was talking. So when people hear words, they automatically assign all the, unconsciously, they automatically assign person to, to app or to persona, you know, when you're talking. That is very important. So even if you don't develop it explicitly, it will still happen. So better do that. Next, um, so you define, you can understand from the voice, uh, age, gender, education, register, uh, both body, you know, those things, locale. Next, um, let me quickly um, try to present. Hmm, it doesn't work. Should be. It should work, yeah, awesome. And then there are these inferred traits. So this is something that person gets during their life. It's not something like age, which is like a person just has, okay? So be, you can understand from voice also intelligence, 
trustworthiness and likability. So these are all features. So if you will kind of enter them and add them to your application, that will be really, really good. Now I want to go back here quickly. So it's not just about voice. So persona is actually defined through lots of things. There is also visual content, which we'll actually uh, study about, uh, talk about tomorrow. And then there is also interaction design and typography. And you can actually define colors, backgrounds, everything on smart display. So that's really important to understand. Now, going back. So that is something, one of my kind of favorite actions from London. So I quickly wanted to show you. So uh, when they developed their action, they actually defined Persona as the real person. Her name is Tio. And she's a millennial and she's hip and happening. So she's really cool that, you know, that really cool girl who always knows about all the events which are happening around uh, London. And here you can see that when we define persona, you kind of pick four, six adjectives. And let's say in her case, she is friendly, exciting, delightful, fun, hip, bold. So this is something you should also define for yourself. Because oftentimes when I open actions, they're so kind of, you know, they're kind of plain. They don't have any, any, any flavor. And so this is very important. Do you want it to be fun? Do you want it to be, I don't know, maybe a little bit like, uh, so I even saw like a, a bit like a root, uh, let's say, actions. But they should have some kind of personality. This is really cool. Now, important, persona is not a person, okay? This is not the same. Persona can be totally fine, just some anthropomorphized animal. For example, reindeer, red nose, it can be um, Easter bunny, it can be alien, it can be AI, cartoon character, or this my, my daughter's favorite uh, cartoon character who is also anthropomorphized animal. Peppa Pig. Uh, I know if it's popular in Austria, but yeah, it's kind of British cartoon. Uh, anyway, so this all can be, so if you feel better, you know, defining your persona as a, a, a piggy, it's totally okay. Next, uh, number two, think outside of box. This is mistake usually Android developers, but how many people here are Android developers? Okay, so you potentially can make this mistake because like I saw like my husband is Android developer, so that's why like he likes to do this all kind of like a Think about all these scenarios, okay, if it will go this way, you know, uh, do this, etc. So you have to just forget about that for assistant. So just don't do that. So w the way you should do that, you should become a very sociable persona in a weird way. So you should sit at home, sometimes alone, and just talk to a computer or to a piece of paper. So what I do, I just write down all kind of dialogues I want to have with Google Assistant why it's very important. The moment you do if, else, for, etc., you start being repetitive. So your action will become boring because the moment you hit the kind of repetitive scenario, you will repeat the same conversation uh, without even thinking about that. That's why what I recommend here, write down the dialogue the way, you know, what could people, you know, possibly ask you. You should also think about unhappy scenarios. So this is a happy scenario, but what if you ask something from user, but user didn't understand, or user told you something, but you didn't understand. How will you, you know, ask it in a different way? Uh, will you say, could you please repeat it, or uh, what was that? So think about that and just write it down, those kind of plain one-level dialogues. And that is something which is super helpful. I know it might sound a bit weird, you know, talking to a paper and writing it down, but it, 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 it does actually help. And, uh, you know, spending a few hours for that, it's really worth it. Number three, context matters. So here, kind of four contexts which I use uh, a lot in uh, developing actions. So I wanted to, there are actually many more, but I wanted to focus on these four. So there is first number four, uh, number one is the environmental one. Remember when you talk to Google Assistant, you can ask, what is the weather? And you don't need to say in London, because um, the Google Home device actually knows your rotation. Number two, situational, what is their intent? So remember, when user is asking something, you shouldn't think, hmm, what is the feature in my app which is, you know, will serve user better? You should actually think, okay, what was user's intent? What would be the closest thing, you know, I can do for a user? You should always think about user as the key person, a king of conversation, okay? Number three is a temporal one. So what happened before, what happened after? Did user order something? Did user say something? Is it, you know, uh, morning, is it evening? So you should always analyze it in a, in a, in a kind of in a timeline. And, and the last one is the behavioral one. 
So this is something the kind of more generic one. How can you actually use all the data from the user in order to help them? And just the easy example also, which actually belongs to both temporal and behavioral one. When you, let's say, want to use Netflix um, and you are locked in, you are authenticated with your account, you can actually ask, when did you pay the, the last bill for Netflix? And Google Assistant can actually tell you potentially that you paid it, let's say, on that particular day. Uh, so that is the, the way you, you can use the, this context, which really help. Now, number four, in conversations, there are no errors. So this is very important to understand. And it sounds really obvious, that's like lots of things about voice, but it's important. Why? So when I'm using Android app, I'm kind of distant, you know. Uh, yes, phone is on my hand, but like hand is just like a, a piece of my body, right? When we're talking about voice, voice is part of your personality and voice is part of your user personality. And you cannot even imagine, like I know it personally as a twice immigrant that uh, when uh, somebody doesn't understand you and you know, there was a day when I was uh, uh, studying German and people might not understand me, you know, from day one. And it was really kind of sad in a way, you know, that people would not understand uh, because I just probably pronunciated the word, you know, in a completely wrong way. But the thing is like, you have to remember that voice is personal. That's why um, there can be so many conditions, so many things that will go wrong. A person just talk for too long, person has an accent, person is too quiet because person is not confident. Maybe person was coughing. Maybe there was just a background noise. There are so many things that can go wrong. And that is why um, we have to think about that, uh, how we can you know, use the situation and don't uncover it as an error. Next, I really like this stat from Google. It's actually really a new stat from, I think, like um, two months ago or maybe even a month ago. Like everybody set alarm clock uh, in the evening. And like I didn't know, but it turns out that people do that in over 5,000 different ways. And think about it, is it just alarm clock? Like, how can you possibly do that in the 5,000 different ways? But people apparently do. So you definitely have to, to think about it. And I actually don't encourage you to enter all 5,000 uh, you know, things uh, into the flow. And tomorrow, if you will come to workshop again from Team A, you will see that uh, how to do that, how to train ML agent uh, in order to machine learning will actually understand uh, all the 5,000 types, even if you enter just 10 of them. But yeah, that's kind of interesting thing. Um, so yeah, definitely never tell the user, I don't understand you. You have to make it in a, in a way that if you actually didn't understand the user, you have to make it as a new term. Okay, I didn't understand the user, what can I do? And there are a few ways you can do. You can, for example, um, you can say, what was that? You can ask it in a different way. For example, if you ask user, uh, uh, so you want to book a flight, uh, what city do you want to fly from and what do you city you want to fly to? But let's say you only go to the first city. You know the user wants to fly from London and you still didn't, didn't get the, the second city. You couldn't identify it. You shouldn't repeat the question. You can just say, okay, thank you very much. The information we have, you are flying from London. Uh, could you please tell me where you are flying to? Because only the second parameter is actually missing, right? So by not being repetitive, by being co cooperative, you're actually helping user and providing really excellent user experience. And yeah, and of course, if, you, if there is no way for you to understand user, sometimes you have to give up and say, do you want to finish it later? Or do you want to come back to that, let's say, tomorrow? So there are different ways, and there are, that's not all, but I don't want, to, of course, to give you all examples. This is something that is part of conversation design theory, and this is something that people study for like years. That's why I'm in no way professional in this, so definitely, but this is just kind of a few cool examples how we can avoid situations where people are frustrated about application. And the last one is think bigger. So, um, Oh, again, uh, remember time, I always refer to time because like uh, when Android started, lots of things um, um, were interesting. For example, people started experimenting with applications. People started creating all these kind of tiny, simple apps f around alcohol. I saw these fart apps and people, do you remember the app which was called Yo, where you can send Yo, just like a two letter word to like all your friends? So, um, I mean, it's okay, okay? Like when platform just appears, people start playing around and testing. But once you are done with all those kind of little games and um, 
I want to say useless, but those kind of things which, uh, which are just gains, you know. I want you to start thinking bigger. So voice is a really unique platform. It actually opens up uh, really amazing opportunities for at least these two group people. I mean, I am saying at least because of course voice is amazing, I believe for everybody. But there are these two groups of people which are limited in usage of technology. Just recently Google developers published an amazing video. I actually posted it on my Twitter. You can check it out. Where, where a guy, he was, uh, he's in, in a wheelchair, so he cannot use, um, you know, uh, everything around him, um, but he can control his home using Google Voice. He can start, you know, devices. He can even lift his bed, uh, which is connected uh, through Assistant SDK to Google Voice, Google Assistant. And that is something which is amazing, which is changing people's life. And more important than, you know, those little apps uh, which are kind of testing apps. Uh, that's why I want you to think about how you can make a difference using this new platform, which provides new opportunities. And number two, uh, it's crazy to think, but there are almost 1 billion illiterate, and this is only adults. We're talking only about 15 plus years old people. And of course, we expect people under 15 years old also being able to read and write, right? But this is a really big number. Now think about that. And actually, there is a research which I didn't put here, but uh, there is a real research showing that there are so many people in India, in uh, Nigeria, in Brazil, who are totally able to speak and totally able to understand, but they just cannot write and read. And they're called illiterate people, right? But Google Assistant, you don't need to actually be able to read and write. So using Google Voice, those people actually get access to technology, to information, to content, and they actually be able to get things done, like transfer money, call relatives, and just maybe schedule a doctor appointment just because voice provides such opportunities. So I want you to think bigger. And if you have device at home, and if you will go tomorrow to workshop and, you know, develop something that will hopefully make a difference. And I'm not saying, you know, about, you know, you know, peace in the whole world or something like, you know, clean water for everybody. Obviously, voice is not that powerful, but something, you know, very simple that is solving particular problem for a particular group of people. Um, and yeah, and it provides basically access to either information or technology for people with uh, different types of uh, disadvantages. Now, let me quickly. Awesome. So now what's next? So we kind of came back to the where we've been. So it's all good. You know, we now know the differences now where we are going. So I want you to encourage, I mean, everybody can Google, but this is kind of documentation where I really recommend you. It's actually quite detailed documentation. I recommend you to start, but I don't want you uh, to be limited to just that. So I really love this particular part, which is design. Now this is the voice design. And if, uh, you know, pretty much everybody knows about material design, you know, we all love the flat. Uh, vector, etc., etc. So not many people actually know about voice design. Even though we all, you know, do the conversation, when you will start reading about voice design, you will get so impressed by things. You will start understanding yourself, and you will start. It will start. It will haunt you because you will start, you know, thinking about the way you speak to people. And this is really, really amazing. So I definitely recommend you to check this part of the documentation. Now there are code labs, uh, three of them. Uh, kind of main ones, so definitely check them out. They're bringing you from very, very basic to all the way actually optimizing for smart home, smart, sorry, smart display. That's why definitely check them out. Level three is uh, smart display. And there is this program. So if, you know, motivation to make something, you know, make a difference um, is not enough for you. So there is also um, motivation uh, to kind of get these milestones. So in real life, actually, let me... The pins look like that. This is how they look. Um, so um, I didn't get actually the engagement one, so I cannot show you. But the traction one you get when your uh, one of your applications will reach, I cannot say how many, but particular number of uh, uh, users. Then engagement you get when uh, people engage with your app in a consistent way. And globalization you will get if you localize your app to at least one more language. And in that one more language, it will be as uh, popular as in the in English language. So those kind of things. And the good thing, news, uh, once you get the first batch, you will also get free Google Home. And not Home Mini, but actually the full-size Google Home. And you will get uh, also a T-shirt uh, with the assistant logo in the back. So that's it. This is the motivation for the... Oh, and you also get 200 cloud credits, which is amazing because you can use it for everything. You can actually use it you know, for Firebase, for all those kind of things. 
And this is the resources to get started. I put here a shameless plug, my Medium uh, publication. So I publish there every month um, kind of recap. So if you guys uh, don't have time, I don't want to say lazy, <laughs> but like, I mean, everybody, we, all, we only have, you know, 24 hours uh, per day. So if you want to learn about Google Assistant, Google Home, and Google Home Hub, and Dialogflow, and everything, everything, everything related to Google Assistant in one place, so just, you can just come to a publication uh, and just read it once a month and it's kind of all compiled for you to read there. And that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, we're still on time for lunch and we have five minutes for questions, right? Is it, is it true? <laughs> oh, thank you. Very good question. So the question is, uh, if you have existing applications, say HR application or something else, pretty much anything, uh, how can you connect uh, your Google Assistant application to that uh, existing application? So there are a few ways. Uh, of course, if you have an existing one, you can just connect it. Uh, you can uh, authenticate user in a, in a completely normal way. So the way you do it, you basically have dialogue flow. And then you will basically write in fulfillment. So you actually authenticate user. Uh, I don't have actually code here, but you will authenticate user there. Um, you can use webhook and then if you can actually also use just Firebase as a database if it's a simpler one. In your case, of course, we are talking about a, a specific functionality and everything, right? But if you guys only have like a database, let's say you have a list of uh, restaurants or a list of uh, something like you say people or in a particular organization which you want to access, I definitely recommend you to use Firebase. Cloud Firestore, for example, real-time database. Or you can also use for storage, say if you want to show images. I, want, I recommend you to use Firebase storage. I'm actually a big fan of Firebase, so definitely use that. But uh, can, uh, answering your question, the way, there is a way to authenticate user. And uh, yeah, so this is definitely, and um, it's actually very important because there are also, uh, there are lots of ways you need it for, because there is also payments you can do on Google Assistant. There are, uh, I want you to actually tell you Google Assistant is a very advanced platform. Yes, people, you know, create quizzes. Let's, uh, yes, people create some simple apps. But you can actually sell goods on Assistant. You can actually access a chart platform, uh, do pretty much anything, uh, you know, using voice on Assistant. So that's definitely possible uh, using authentication uh, too. Often. Yeah? Uh, but you can also ask about Hub or anything, even if I didn't cover it here. Yeah, please. Yes, uh, so basically, uh, it's a very good question. So uh, the question is what type of application is allowed on Google Assistant? So um, uh, in, in general, of course, you have to follow all the copyright rules. So you cannot, let's say, create application which is uh, using existing uh, company's name because in this case, you will need to connect your website, let's say, um, uh, Alice uh, DSL uh, to the, you know, your particular action. So that's not possible, but and then in case if you're creating applications for children, you have to put them in specific category because not all countries right now support applications, let's say, for kids. And this is something that also there are restrictions. There are actually a few restrictions. There is, for example, no way to create action which has name of from, uh, consisting from one word. So there are, it should be at least two word names, which is kind of a weird limitation, and I, it annoys me as well, but um, there are kind of uh, such things. But in general, as long as it's not offensive, it's not, you know, uh, you're not trying to sell drugs or those kind of things, uh, if it's not um, explicitly legal, and it uh, follows all the copyright rules, then you are free to go. As long as, uh, you know, uh, you can publish in that country, because not all countries are uh, yet allowed to publish apps. And uh, if it's for kids, uh, that country should also allow to publish it for kids. That. Yes, 
That's a very good question. The question, if you have to be, I will actually extend it even. Uh, if you have two, pe uh, two people at home, this is the last question, unfortunately, because I don't want to keep you even, long, even longer. So um, the question is, um, if you have two people at home and uh, you want to both use Google Home uh, kind of from different accounts, what is, the, if, what is the kind of secure way? Will you be able to access uh, you know, financial services separately? The answer is yes because uh, Google Assistant has the voice uh, uh, identification. So Google Assistant will actually know who they're talking to in case of, let's say, Spotify, etc. And I can even continue. You can even use Google Assistant and Google Home in two different languages. So if, let's say, you want to speak in German and your wife is, or girlfriend is, let's say, French, and she wants to talk to it, at the, let's say, right after you in French, you don't need to swap you know, and change constantly languages. You can actually talk to in two different languages to different applications, it's all safe. All you need to do is basically just uh, just use it and authenticate yourself, you know, in two different accounts. That's that's possible. Okay, two cash uh, in your lunch break, but I think that yes, you place. can find me on Twitter. Just please, you know, tweet me if you have any questions. Maybe you will, you know, come tomorrow. Hopefully, we'll see you tomorrow, and then you can always ask us any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.